When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to another round of Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and it's always a blessing to be able to study the scriptures with you. So thanks for inviting me to be a part of your scripture study for this week. Today, we'll be studying Alma chapter 5 through 7. These are masterpiece chapters. I hope they'll give us each a chance to look inward and see some things, maybe that we don't want to see, but that we need to see. Alma 5 has more question marks than any other chapter in the Book of Mormon. And though we won't answer every single question together, each one really is worth pondering. In some ways, this is the preview of what Judgment Day might look like or feel like as we go through a personal interview of sorts with the prophet Alma the Younger. This chapter actually reminds me of a talk that startled me. This was given back in October of 2014 from a member of the Quorum of the Seventy that I'd never heard of before, Elder Klebingat. But right out of the chute, he just riveted my attention by asking these questions. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your spiritual confidence before God? No wind-up. This was the pitch. Are you ready to meet Him? Do you have a personal witness that your current offering as a Latter-day Saint is sufficient to inherit eternal life? Can you say within yourself that Heavenly Father is pleased with you? What thoughts come to mind if you had a personal interview with your Savior one minute from now? Would sins, regrets, and shortcomings dominate your self-image? Or would you simply experience joyful anticipation? Would you meet or avoid his gaze? Would you linger by the door or confidently walk up to him? One riveting paragraph with nothing but questions, seven of them to be exact, each of which forced me to really look inward and wonder, what would that interview look like one minute from now? Well, it's been six years since that talk was given, so I'm glad I've had more than one minute. But in the intervening time, I have given a lot of thought to those questions. How prepared am I to meet my Maker? How would I feel in a personal interview with Christ? I actually remember a time in high school, I was applying for a scholarship for college, and part of the scholarship involved an interview. Now, there was a whole lineup of people that were interviewing for this, and I remember sitting there, this was back in L.A., and we were all waiting to be brought in to be grilled, we thought, by this panel that was going to decide the winner of the scholarship. And I remember looking down the line and seeing how nervous everyone was. And I was surprised that I didn't feel that way. And as I pondered, I thought, why aren't I more nervous? Why don't I feel like everybody else seems to feel? And it hit me, I'm a Latter-day Saint. Talk about an unfair advantage. I've been having interviews since I was a little kid. And compared to the bishop, these guys are probably going to be a piece of cake. They don't have the gift of discernment. They're not going to ask me about worthiness issues. I can step in and confidently respond to whatever they have to ask me. And I did. And then ended up getting the scholarship. Little did I know that all those bishops' interviews as a youth would literally pay dividends. Well, the kinds of questions that we're going to see here are very different than the kinds that a scholarship panel would ask. They're a little bit closer to the kind of things that we would respond to in a Temple Recommend interview. I've conducted a lot of those over the years, and it's always interesting to see people and how they respond to those questions. Not in their answers, their yeses or nos, but in their feelings. How hesitant some are to say that they're worthy, even when they are, and how happy other people are to be able to share their testimony, their standards, and the desire they have to be able to answer for the life of discipleship that they're living. Like I said, Alma chapter 5 has more question marks than any other chapter in the Book of Mormon, 42 to be precise. It's the Book of Mormon's equivalent of Job chapter 38 through 40, where there are 63 question marks. But that time, it's God asking the questions of Job, trying to help Job come to grips with what he's going through by understanding that he doesn't understand all that God does. Alma's purposes are somewhat different. He's not asking questions to get us to understand God. He's asking questions to get us to understand ourselves and to see whether or not we're ready to return to God if we're really like Him or not. If we are, then hopefully we can turn a lot of these question marks into exclamation points. 
kind of like Joseph Smith does in section 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants. That's the chapter that has more exclamation points than any other chapter in the standard works. Fifteen of them. Joseph's on fire. Well, Alma the Younger's hope is that we catch fire as well with the help of this introspection that he's encouraging us to participate in. Why is he doing it? Because he's got a mess to clean up. This interview in chapter 5 grows out of the challenges that Alma recognized at the end of chapter 4. Challenges within the church that prompted him to take off his political hat, to confine himself wholly to the holy priesthood. We've already seen plenty of chapters where the church is struggling based on the persecution that they're facing. But by the end of chapter 4, the church is the problem. We see things like pride and materialism, independence from God, riches and worldliness, scorn, persecution of others, contentions, envy and strife, malice. The people in the church, at least certain people in the church, were worse than those outside of the church, to the point that the church had become a stumbling block to spirituality rather than a stepping stone towards it. Now, of course, not everyone in the church was that way. But enough of them were that Alma felt compelled to cry repentance to those who supposedly had already covenanted to take the Lord's name upon them, to always remember him, to keep his commandments which he had given them. Well, they weren't. And so Alma, beginning at church headquarters in Zarahemla, begins to go throughout the land to preach the word of God to those that supposedly already knew it. In verse 1, Alma begins to deliver the word of God unto the people, first in the land of Zarahemla, and from thence throughout all the land. Verse 2, these are words which he spake to the people in the church. And again, it's church members that need this. We often talk about the threefold mission of the church, to perfect the saints. Well, they needed perfecting. To proclaim the gospel. He's doing that too. To redeem the dead. Well, in some ways, these were the spiritually dead. In fact, through much of the rest of Alma, at least the first half or so, that threefold mission is one way to kind of wrap our brains around what is happening here. And once the church has accomplished those missions, what are we ready for? We're ready to battle the enemy of all righteousness. There's the war chapters. We're ready to endure the last days. That's the book of Helaman. And we're prepared to witness the glorious coming of Jesus Christ. That's third Nephi. But it all begins here with setting the church in order, beginning in downtown Zarahemla. As it says in section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, first set in order thy house. The church has to be a holy place to bring people into. Imagine if the sons of Mosiah, with all this success on their missions, if they were to bring back all of these Lamanite converts into a church that was persecuting, prideful, materialistic, those poor anti-Nephi Lehi's would have wondered, what have we gotten ourselves into? We have to set our own lives in order first. We have to set the church in order. Or as the Lord says later in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 112, in preparing the world for the second coming, he says, Upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name and have not known me. That describes these Nephite church members to a T. And so before we turn our gaze to these wonderful missionary chapters in the book of Alma, the church that the missionaries are bringing people into needs to be cleansed and purified. They need to cleanse and purify themselves. Before we get into the specific questions that Alma asks to try to facilitate that, I do want to say something about the tone that he's using as he does so. If you turn ahead to verse 43... This is one of my favorite scriptures about teaching the gospel. Over the years, as I've trained early morning seminary teachers, I've often asked them to look in Alma 5.43 for the three P's of gospel teaching. Unfortunately, only one of the words actually begins with P, the way Alma wrote it. But if we translate his statements into our words, I think we'll see the three P's. Alma 5.43, Now, my brethren, I would that ye should hear me. Sounds a little like King Benjamin. I haven't brought you here to trifle with my words. Open your eyes and your ears and your hearts. For I speak in the energy of my soul. There's the first P. Energy. Or as I would say, power. Passion. It's hard to light a fire in others if it's not burning within ourselves. So teach with passion. Teach with power. Teach as Alma does with all the energy of your soul. Second, behold, I have spoken unto you plainly that ye cannot err. Now that's an obvious P. It's not enough to teach with power and passion if we're not being understood. 
That's like rallying the troops, but not giving them any clear direction on what to do with all of that roused energy. But to speak plainly. That was Nephi's forte, right? I glory in plainness. Or as he says at the beginning of 2 Nephi 31, I'm going to speak so plainly, not just that you understand, but so that you cannot misunderstand. I don't want you to err. How do we take heaven and bring it down to earth in a way that makes sense to people? Plainly. And then third, I have spoken according to the commandments of God. What P word do I associate with that? Permission. I have God's permission to teach the things that I'm teaching you today. These are the things that God would have me convey. That's relevance, personal application of all that could be taught. It's the Holy Ghost saying, this is what they need. This is what I'm commanding you as a teacher to convey to my students, my children. Again, King Benjamin follows this same example, and we need to as well. But Alma the Younger, in trying to whip the church into shape, is teaching with passion and power. He is teaching with plainness, and he is teaching with permission. Amazing things come as a result. 44, this is exactly how the Lord wants him and us to teach. I am called to speak after this manner, according to the holy order of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Yea, I am commanded to stand and testify unto this people, the things which have been spoken by our fathers concerning the things which are to come. Yea, I am commanded to stand and testify unto this people. But verse 45, this is not all. Because what fills us with passion and power, what grants to us God's permission to speak plainly the things that we know, is the fact that we know certain things. It's testimony that's driving our teachings. It's not curriculum. It's conviction. It's truth born of testimony. Power born of personal experience. In 45, he says, Do you not suppose that I know of these things myself? Behold, I testify unto you that I do know that these things whereof I have spoken are true. How do you suppose that I know of their surety? Behold, I say unto you, they are made known unto me by the Holy Spirit of God. Notice he's not giving the angel credit here. The appearance of the angel forced Alma to stop in his tracks and realize what he was doing. It proved to him the reality of God and God's power, but didn't necessarily confirm every theological doctrine that his father had been teaching them. That testimony came, according to Alma the Younger, by the Holy Spirit of God. Behold, I have fasted and prayed many days that I might know these things of myself. I doubt he was counting the two days and two nights in that spiritual coma as his period of fasting and prayer. If I counted being asleep as fasting, I fast every night. He did learn some amazing things in that ordeal. Rising back to consciousness, marvel not that we must all be born again. But I imagine there were other periods of fasting and prayer, many days worth, so that he might know of these things for himself. The angel's appearance may have halted the downward spiral, but the upward climb was on Alma. And it was his fasting and prayer that helped him reach the summit of testimony that he's now bearing. As he says, now I do know of myself that they are true. Sound a little like Joseph Smith coming out of the sacred grove. I have learned for myself, as he says to his mother. For the Lord God hath made them manifest unto me by his Holy Spirit. And this is the spirit of revelation which is in me. 47, his testimony continues. The words which have been spoken by our fathers are true. 48, I know of myself that whatsoever I shall say unto you concerning that which is to come is true. I say unto you, I know that Jesus Christ shall come, yea, the Son, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and mercy and truth. I know, I know, I know. He says it eight times in these four verses. The energy he mentions in 43 is not the energy of an adrenaline rush. This isn't just enthusiasm that he's trying to work up in people. Actually, maybe it is. But only if we take enthusiasm for what it really means. Theos is the root for God, as in theology. Well, enthusiasm literally means God within. Sadly, we've lost that connotation with the word now. But originally, enthusiasm was that sense that God is speaking within us and through us. And that's the source of Alma's power and passion. 
the testimony of truth that was in him. But why use questions? Why not just teach and testify? He does. But why so many questions? If you remember our discussion from last week, whether it was King Mosiah's abdication of authority back in Mosiah 29, or Alma's abdication of political power in Alma 4, in both instances, it was a recognition on their part. It has to come out of you. It's not going to be the commands of a king, but it will arise from the voice of the people. Or in Alma's case, it's not the proclamations of a chief judge. It's the persuasion of a high priest. Real change. The kind of change that has to take place in the church if it's going to be a welcoming place, a place worth coming into. The change has to emerge from within. It cannot be imposed from without. They're going to need to see themselves for what they really are. Exactly what King Benjamin was trying to do. These unprofitable servants, once they see themselves as such. In Alma's case as well, once you see yourself for who you really are, you'll know who you really need, which is Jesus. As a result, you will turn to him for the kind of changes that only he can affect from inside each of us. In some ways, Alma the Younger is playing the angel in this act, asking questions in hopes that it would halt the church from its downward slide, that they would be forced to grapple as he was with his own natural man tendencies, followed by, ideally, their own period of fasting and prayer for as many days as was required until they could say, I do know of myself that I need to change and that through Christ I can. That's the point of all these question marks. In fact, all 42 of them can be boiled down to only three. And those three questions really are the same question, just asked in three different ways. They're all in verse 14. Alma chapter 5 verse 14 really is the point of this message from the prophet. Now behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church. Number one, have ye spiritually been born of God? Number two, have ye received his image in your countenances? Number three, have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Isn't that the same question that King Benjamin was asking? To see if his people had experienced a new birth? so that they could take upon themselves this new name, that of Christian, to see if they had been born of him, become his sons and his daughters, spiritually begotten. There is newness in those three questions in verse 14. Born of God, a new image in your countenance. Is there family resemblance there? This is the who's your daddy lesson that we talked about in Mosiah chapter 5 all over again. This mighty change in your hearts, a new creature, a new birth, new family resemblances, new genes. Alma is asking church members, are you different because of your membership? He's asking converts, have you truly been converted? Which means, have you been changed? Remember Elder Bednar's experience as a teenager? A zealous Latter-day Saint teenager with a non-member father? who came to church all the time to support the family, but had no interest in joining it himself. And yet a young Elder Bednar, can't you picture him? Passionate, plain, probably with perfectly well-set hair as always, talking to his dad, when are you going to get baptized, dad? When are you going to get baptized? And his dad always saying, I'm only going to join the church because I know it's true, not for you or for your mother. But remember that story that Elder Bednar told of the time that he kept needling his dad about being baptized and his father finally said to him, Okay, son, you claim to be the members of the true church? Well, having been raised Catholic, I could say the same thing. You claim to hold the holy priesthood? Well, we claim the same. So instead of you asking when I'm going to get baptized, i got a question for you, son. When I go to church, when I go to priesthood meeting particularly, how come the bishop has to plead, has to twist arms to try to get the priesthood holders in your ward to do anything? The men in your church don't seem to be any more actively engaged in God's service than the men in mine. If your church really is true, if you really hold the priesthood, shouldn't that make you different? That was the point. Shouldn't these things make us different, changed, born again, more like Jesus, his image in our countenances, that we look like him, we act like him, we think like him, we feel like him, we serve like him, we love like him. 
Isn't that the goal of the second coming? That we will see him like he is and we will be like him. It reminds me of a missionary email I received over a decade ago. Because I spend my life teaching young adults, I get to know a lot of missionaries. And so I get a lot of emails back from them as they're serving around the world. This one has stood out in my mind ever since. He talks about wanting to learn what compassion is. He talked to his mission president about it. But the lesson really came when he lived the principle himself. He talked about a set of missionaries in his district that was having a really tough time. One was nearing the end of his mission and was thinking more about life at home rather than life in the field. As this elder describes it, they had just lost hope. They lost hope in working, in being obedient, in being happy. I could tell by going on an exchange with them because their apartment was trashed. Literally, there was trash everywhere. Dirty clothes thrown on the floor, dirty dishes piled in the sink, trash overflowing in garbage cans. It was bad. Well, this elder came up with a plan. They rallied eight missionaries together and set up this game plan. They were going to secretly sneak into the other missionary's apartment, clean it up, and then get out before they got discovered. Well, he describes the event, the gleaming floors and sparkling toilet. But then he ends the email with this. I'll use his words because they're so powerful. Again, this is a 20-year-old young man, the type that's probably not used to finding great joy in cleaning up other people's garbage. He said, as I was reflecting on what had just happened, I noticed that we were cleaning up some pretty nasty stuff. But no one complained. No one questioned why they had to clean the toilet and not someone else. No one wasted a single moment. All of us worked hard. All of us did our part. And we were joking and laughing the whole time. I think that might have been an example of compassion. There are some absolutely wonderful elders I've been blessed to serve and serve around. Later that day, I had a chance to talk to the elders on the phone. I could tell that a change had taken place in them. For the first time this transfer, they sounded happy. They were laughing and singing and telling jokes. My happiness came when I found that they were happy. I think this might be what it's all about, serving and helping people in need. That brings true happiness. And then this final paragraph, which blew me away. All I know is that before my mission, it would never have even crossed my mind to clean someone else's junk. I know that the church and gospel of Jesus Christ have been restored to the earth because of the change it has made in me. I'm different than I used to be. Can we say that? Can we say that because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm different than I used to be? That's what Alma is after. Have you been born of God? Have you received his image in your countenance? Have you experienced a mighty change of heart, not just of outward behavior, but of inner desire, of motivation, of disposition, as King Benjamin calls it. What does Jesus do? He changes things. And so how do you know if you're a true disciple of him? Because he's changed you. Oh, the church needed so much change. So that's what Alma is after. A change that has to come from within. So let me ask you some questions that point in the direction of these three great questions. Really the one great question. Have you been changed by Christ? Now to try to make sense of Alma chapter 5 and all these 42 question marks that appear, I'm going to try to boil it down into three kind of subsections, all of which are aiming towards that great goal of change through Christ. Spiritual rebirth, new image, new heart. One set of sub-questions has to do with the past and what they are remembering from it. A second set of sub-questions has to do with the future, specifically Judgment Day and if they're prepared for it. And in between those questions of looking backwards and looking forwards are, is this set of sub-questions about current lifestyle standard of worthiness, the present. And if I remember my past and anticipate a certain future, then my present will be lived in a certain way. That's what Alma is hoping for. The first set of question marks begins appearing in verse 6. Now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, you that belong to this church, have you sufficiently retained in remembrance the captivity of your fathers? Yea, and have you sufficiently retained in remembrance his mercy and long suffering towards them? 
And moreover, have ye sufficiently retained in remembrance that he has delivered their souls from hell? Notice the repeated phrases in verse 6. He doesn't just say, do you remember? He asks, have you retained in remembrance? We talked about remembering in a previous episode. Remembering, putting back together the parts that form the whole. But even remembering sometimes comes across as something outside of us, ourselves. Oh, I just remembered. It popped into my head. As opposed to this active, ongoing, retain in remembrance. This is a mindfulness when it comes to the experiences that we've had with God. A bringing it back instead of just waiting it for it to pop back in. To retain in our remembrance. Not only does he strengthen the verb, he adds an adverb. And with each of those three questions, he asks, have you sufficiently retained in remembrance? So it's not just remember, it's retain in remembrance. And it's not just retain in remembrance, it's have you sufficiently done it? Have you done it enough? Now, how do I know if I've done it enough? It's one thing to go, oh, I remember that. It pops in every once in a while. It's another thing to say, oh, I do my best to retain it in remembrance, to keep it in mind. But sufficiently? How do I even know? Well, in this case, the proof will be in the pudding. How do I know if I've done it enough? If it's actually working. If it's doing something to me. If it's making me want to make certain changes in my life. Then I'm sufficiently mindful about certain things. And what are those certain things? The first question was about captivity. The third question was about deliverance. And squeezed between them was the attributes of God that brought them from captivity to deliverance, namely his mercy and long-suffering. That's what Alma is asking them to retain in remembrance, that God is a merciful and long-suffering Father who specializes in taking people out of captivity and bringing them into deliverance. Can you hold that in your heads? Enough that you'll actually allow the same thing to happen for yourself? To recognize your own captivity? You're in the same sinking ship. And to have trust in your own deliverance? But knowing that that's only going to happen through the mercy and long-suffering of God? Alma helps them remember these things. He wants to help them retain it in their remembrance. So in verse 3 and 4, he talks about his own father. Hiding in the waters of Mormon, setting up a church there in bondage to King Noah, and yet in verse 4, delivered out of their hands by the mercy and power of God. See the three again? In bondage, even as they were hiding in the waters of Mormon, they had to hide because of that captivity that they were suffering under. Deliverance out of King Noah's hands, how mercy and power of God. Verse 5, Here's round two of the same process. They're now in the land of Helam, right? But then the Lamanites come, the Amulonites are over them, captivity all over again. Middle of five, they were in captivity, and again the Lord did deliver them out of bondage. How? By the power of his word. So captivity, bondage, God's power, God's word, moving them from one to the other. What effect did that have? Verse 7, God changed their hearts. Yea, he awakened them out of a deep sleep, and they awoke unto God. Alma is confident the same can happen to these sleeping saints in the land of Zarahemla. They were in the midst of darkness, just like his audience is, but their souls were illuminated by the light of the everlasting word. They were encircled about by the bands of death and the chains of hell and everlasting destruction did await them. There's captivity. But were they destroyed? No. Were those bands and chains broken and loosed? Yes. That's deliverance. All through the mercy and power, long-suffering and love of the Holy Messiah. Retain that in your remembrance and do it sufficiently to know that the same can happen to you. He fast forwards from past to future, from captivity and deliverance to final judgment, starting in verse 15. Do you exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward? Again, this future-facing, forward-looking faith. Do you look forward with an eye of faith 
and view this mortal body raised in immortality, this corruption raised in incorruption, to stand before God to be judged according to the deeds which have been done in the mortal body? If you do look forward to final judgment, then I hope you have rehearsed the process of captivity to deliverance often enough that you know that the same can happen for you. Because we're all in bondage to sin. We're all deserving of the bands of death and the chains of hell. But if we know God's mercy and long suffering, then ultimate captivity need not be our final consequence. But it's going to take some change on our part to begin with. Verse 16, can you really imagine to yourselves that you hear the voice of the Lord saying, Come unto me, ye blessed, for behold, your works have been the works of righteousness upon the face of the earth. If you're envisioning that 60 second from now final interview that Elder Clebbing got encouraged, is that what you envision? Or are we more like verse 17? imagining to ourselves, and yes, this would be pure imagination, that we can lie unto the Lord and say, oh, no, no, of course, my works have been righteous works upon the face of the earth. Do we really think he's going to fall for that? I remember once, as a junior high school kid, lying to my mom. I won't get into the gory details. My family knows it and still makes fun of me for it. But she actually bought it. She was either the most gullible or the most trusting person imaginable. Well, eventually the truth did come out. And I got busted for it. But God is not gullible. We'll never slink away from the judgment bar going, I can't believe he fell for that. As it says in the book of Hebrews, haunting phrase, that all things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He sees it as clearly as can be. The all-seeing eye of God we talk about. Go ahead and imagine to yourselves that you can lie. Someday you'll be corrected in that misconception. A much more likely scenario for the unrepentant would be verse 18. Brought before the tribunal of God with our souls filled with guilt and remorse. Having a remembrance of all our guilt. A perfect remembrance of all our wickedness. Yea, a remembrance that we have set at defiance the commandments of God. This is exactly what Jacob described back in 2 Nephi 9 verse 14 that we will have a perfect knowledge of all of our nakedness. I connect that word from Jacob with that word from Hebrews, that all things are naked and open. We will be fully exposed to God's all-seeing eye with nothing to cover our nakedness, nothing to hide behind. That actually clarifies for me something that I had wondered about from my own temple worship. I won't go into detail in order to protect the sacredness of that ordinance. But I always wondered, why are we reminded of our own nakedness even when we're covered by the atonement of Jesus Christ? Why hold on to our own inadequate attempts to hide from God's view, to cover our own nakedness, when it's painfully insufficient? The Lord comes and offers us true coverage, That's what the atonement is in Hebrew. To cover is to atone. Then why not let our futile attempts just disappear in the past? I think because there are some things that need to be retained in our remembrance. Our own captivity, for example. Our own pathetic attempts to cover our nakedness. So that once we're truly covered by Christ's atoning grace... There is a comparison in our minds, a visible, powerful, memorable comparison between captivity and deliverance, between our attempts to cover ourselves and God's power to truly wash crimson sin into white, white wool. The coat of the lamb covering the blood of the lamb, which we have spilt. In verse 19 Can you look up to God at that day with a pure heart and clean hands? Isn't that what Psalm 24 is asking for? Clean hands and a pure heart. Elder Oaks has talked about that. That clean hands are our actions, but pure hearts are our attributes, our motives. It's not just what we do. There's the hands. It's what we think. It's what we feel. There's the heart. It's not just our deeds. It's our disposition. Have we been changed sufficiently? In both regards. The second half of that verse, he asks another question. 
Can you look up having the image of God engraven upon your countenance? Again, hinting back to that threefold question he asks in verse 14. Do we look like him? Isaiah describes the opposite when he says that the show of their countenance doth witness against them. We talk about sometimes, oh, he has guilt written all over his face. Well, can we have innocence written all over our face? Namely, the face of Jesus, his image in our countenance. That beautiful final verse in Moroni 7, that we will be pure as he is pure, for we shall be like him. This actually made me think of something completely new for me from section 109 of the Doctrine and Covenants. When Joseph's dedicating the Kirtland Temple, in verse 53, he prays, Inasmuch as they will repent, thou art gracious and merciful, and will turn away thy wrath when thou lookest upon the face of thine anointed. I've always loved that verse, that looking at us, he will see guilt, but turning his gaze towards his only begotten son, and he will see innocence, an innocence intense enough to more than make up for our guilt. But this thought of having his image upon our countenance, I wonder if God has to turn his gaze at all. If he looks at us and looks deeply enough, if Christ's image has been engraved upon our countenance, then God can turn away his wrath without having to turn away his gaze because he will see the face of his anointed in our own. My youngest daughter looks a lot like my wife. And there are times my heart just melts looking at her because of the mother that she reminds me of. To see that image in that little countenance. And I wonder if God's heart will melt into compassion, into mercy, into long-suffering, when he sees the face of his anointed in our own. But that can only come through rebirth, of seeking that family resemblance. Otherwise, notice verse 20. Can you think of being saved when you have yielded yourselves to become subjects to the devil? Again, that's the other possible answer to the who's your daddy question. And there's family resemblance on that side of the tree as well. Do you really think God can save you when you've been subjected to the devil? Subjects to a king of your choice rather than to the king of kings. Subjects, in fact, is only one word. In verse 25, he talks about children of the kingdom of the devil. In verse 39, he says, if you're not the sheep of the good shepherd, then what fold are you? There's only one other possibility, right? There's only two shepherds out there, a good one and a bad one. And in this dualism, if Christ is not your shepherd, the shepherd of your choosing, then the devil is your shepherd. You are of his fold. Who can deny this? Whosoever denieth this is a liar and a child of the devil. 41, he says it again. If you bring forth good works and hearken to the voice of the good shepherd, then you follow him, you're in his fold. But if you bring forth evil works, the same becometh a child of the devil, for he hearkeneth unto his voice and doth follow him. And that's who pays your wages. Verse 42, the wages of death. It's all that the adversary can pay you with. The child of the devil, the sheep of the devil, the fold of the devil, the subjects of the devil, as opposed to subjects and sheep and children of God. These are the choices that we're making. And we're making them every day, right now, in anticipation of that future day of reckoning. Verse 21, if we've chosen poorly, you will know at that day that you cannot be saved. Cannot be. Not will not be. Cannot be. God cannot deny his own justice. He will force no man to heaven as we sing in Know This That Every Soul Is Free. There can no man be saved except his garments are washed white. Notice the need for washing there. None of us makes it through life unscathed, unstained, unblemished. But we have to be willing to have our garments washed. Yea, his garments must be purified. Not pure, but purified. Until they are cleansed, not clean, but cleansed from all stain. Through the blood of him of whom it has been spoken by our fathers. Who should come to redeem his people from their sins.
Sin is understood. It's inevitable. It describes each of us. But if we will come unto Christ, then garments in need of washing can be washed. Garments that were not forever pure can be purified. Stained clothing can be cleansed through the blood of Christ. How would you feel otherwise? Verse 22. How will any of you feel if you shall stand before the bar of God, having your garments stained with blood and all manner of filthiness? Behold, what will these things testify against you? 23. They'll testify of our guilt. And how will that make us feel? 24. Do you suppose that such an one can have a place to sit down in the kingdom of God with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with all the holy prophets? whose garments are cleansed, not clean. Again, these past participles are some of the most merciful examples of the grammar of God. These holy prophets, their garments are cleansed and as a result are now spotless, pure, and white. And how would you feel to pull up a chair beside any one of them, knowing how hopelessly underdressed you are in comparison? Joseph Smith talked about this occasionally about what we'll feel to pull up a chair next to the ancients. As he was languishing in Liberty Jail and the people were being driven out of the state of Missouri to a swampy marsh on the eastern side of the Mississippi that was far from becoming Nauvoo the Beautiful. He talked to them about Abraham and Abrahamic tests and Abrahamic sacrifices, wondering if they would be able to measure up to these Abrahamic comparisons. Joseph wanted to. The saints wanted to. We will want to as well. I sometimes joke that my father-in-law is the closest thing to Job that I've ever met. I picture him pulling up a chair next to Job and feeling very comfortable in sharing his story. I think Job will probably be the one going, wow, I thought I had it bad. Me, on the other hand, I'm going to feel very sheepish pulling up a chair next to Job and comparing my minor inconveniences to his major tests and trials. We sometimes talk about comparing scar stories when we meet people. I don't think any of us will want to compare stain stories. Instead, if we've repented, we can all rejoice that our garments have each been cleansed. And it's only because of the blood of the Lamb that we can ever hope to claim to be spotless, pure, and white. Do we see what Alma is doing here? Look to the past and see captivity and deliverance bridged over by the divine attributes of Christ. Look to your future. Which will you imagine? Which do you envision for that future? Continued captivity or a merciful deliverance? One or the other will occur. And with that in mind, those two possible scenarios, what are you doing right now? with your life? What behavioral changes, what attitudinal changes, what motivational changes need to take place right now in hopes of facilitating the ultimate change, the mighty change of heart? Those are the kinds of questions he begins asking in verse 27, forcing them to look themselves in the mirror and grapple with what they see. Verse 27, have ye walked keeping yourselves blameless before God? Could you say if you were called to die at this time? Remember, interviews coming up in 60 seconds. And could you say it within yourselves? We typically know when we're lying. It's one thing to feign innocence for someone else, but could we say these things within ourselves without flinching? knowing that we know better. Can we say within ourselves that we have been sufficiently humble? There's that pesky adverb again. Sufficiently? Really? You mean it's not enough to be humble? I have to be humble enough? How do I know? As I said earlier, you'll know based on the results of that humility. If it's causing you to change, then yes, You're humble enough. If it's not yet doing that, then there's still more humility to be developed. 
Can you say within yourselves that you've been cleansed and made white? Again, not clean and white, but cleansed and made white through the blood of Christ who will come to redeem his people from their sins. Verse 28, have you been stripped of pride? What a verb, to be stripped of it, to have it yanked off of us. I remember as a little kid, little, little kid, on a family vacation, we were at a motel with an indoor swimming pool. We hardly ever went on trips like that. Uh, We thought we'd arrived. Now, I was old enough to be able to swim and old enough to be something of an adventure seeker, but also young enough that my dad was still really in shape. Ex-Marine, okay? Uh, And I remember being in the swimming pool with him and playing games with my family, brothers and sisters and so on. And I said, Dad, I just want you to launch me. I want you to throw me out of the water as far as you possibly can. I remember crouching into kind of a ball, putting my, facing him, putting my hands on his shoulders, and then standing on his cupped hands. And I was trying to pump him up. I said, Dad, I just want you to throw me over your shoulder as far as you possibly can. I want to fly, Dad. Let's, I have the tiger, okay? And so he's going, okay, son, you ready? And he's like, one, two, and there I am, ready to just launch. I wanted to be airborne. Now, I think both of us were full of adrenaline by now. And so one, two. Two, by the time he got to three, he launched me so hard, I went flying across the swimming pool. But he shot me out of the water so fast that my little swimsuit went And there was this naked little kid flying through the air until he landed in the deep end. I was horrified. I imagine my mom was too. And there I was, Dad, throw me my shorts. And he threw me my swimming suit and all was well. It was just our family in the pool anyway. But I was stripped of pride that day. I was stripped of all everything. I had nothing to cover my nakedness. And so when Alma uses that verb, it stings a little. It wasn't my choice. We typically don't talk about stripping ourselves. We usually say we took our clothes off. Stripped is something that often happens to somebody else. Like President Benson said in his classic talk about pride. God will have a humble people. We can either choose to be humble or we will be compelled to be humble. In other words, we can either take our pride off or we will be stripped of it. Either humility or humiliation. Maybe that's a better word for it. I was humiliated. In other words, I was humiliated the moment I was stripped of my pride. There are still times I pray to Heavenly Father asking for more time. Times of praying, Heavenly Father, I am trying to take off my pride. Please give me time to do so before you strip me of it. He used the same verb in 29 when it comes to envy. Have we been stripped of that too? So many of these attributes of the natural man. Are we putting off the natural man? Or are we having the natural man stripped from us because we wouldn't lay it aside ourselves? That process of removal is part of the mighty change that we all must undergo. To put off the natural man and become a saint through the atonement of Christ. A new child. A new child of him. If we can't answer in the affirmative about removing those lesser attributes... Then in 28 and again in 29, he tells us we're not prepared. We're still in the captivity instead of the deliverance stage that we saw in that first set of past looking questions. And that is not bode well as we look forward in those future facing questions about judgment. So prepare, prepare quickly, he says in those verses. The kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. Such an one hath not eternal life. Now hold on to those thoughts, those phrases preparing quickly, the kingdom of heaven being soon at hand. We'll come back to them in just a moment. But a few more of the present tense questions. We've seen stripped of pride. We've seen stripped of envy. Remember, this is a church that has fallen prey to materialism, to neglect of the poor. That's all pride and envy driving those things. In verse 30, Is there one among you that doth make a mock of his brother, or that heapeth upon him persecutions? That's another element that Alma has seen among church members. Seriously, go back to Alma 4, and you'll see all the problems that are driving these questions in Alma 5. 
Just like Jacob 5 answers the question posed at the end of Jacob 4, Alma 5 is asking questions in response to the problems seen back in Alma 4. Jump ahead and you'll see more of them. In verse 53, can you be puffed up in the pride of your hearts? Will you persist in the wearing of costly apparel, setting your heart upon the vain things of the world, upon your riches? That's exactly what these wicked church members had been doing. 54, will you persist in supposing you're better one than another? After all that Alma's father had done in trying to set up an equality through the church, and even an equality through the people by shifting things to the reign of the judges. Remember all that we saw back in chapter 18 of Mosiah and later in the book with no hierarchy, really? Teachers no better than learners? Priests no higher than parishioners? Do you really think you're better than each other? Will ye persist in the persecution of your brethren who humble themselves and walk after the holy order of God? In 55, will you persist in turning your backs upon the poor and the needy in withholding your substance from them? Because any of this persistence, persistence in pride, persistence in envy, persistence in persecution, persistence in neglect of the poor, all of it boils down to this phrase from the beginning of verse 53. Can you lay aside these things and trample the Holy One under your feet? Because that's what you're doing. The exact opposite of how beautiful upon the mountains are those that publish peace. Well, how about these feet that trample underneath them the Holy One of Israel? Can we really fool ourselves into thinking that we can look up to Him at that moment of judgment? If we have been looking down on him through a lifetime of trampling him under our feet, I would so much rather have Jesus wash my feet than to have me dirty him through my trampling. How are we doing? How are we doing with this interview? Looking now at my present, what do I perceive of my future? Do I remember those past experiences of captivity and deliverance? And with that in mind, do I have hope that I might emerge from my captivity into a glorious deliverance through the atonement of Christ? That's Alma's hope all along. He's not trying to shame us into change. He's not trying to force us. There's no compulsion here. That's why it's all questions in hopes that they will have a desire to change on their own. How are we doing? How are we doing with this interview? Looking now at my present, what do I perceive of my future? Do I remember those past experiences of captivity and deliverance? And with that in mind, do I have hope that I might emerge from my captivity into a glorious deliverance through the atonement of Christ? That's Alma's hope all along. He's not trying to shame us into change. He's not trying to force us. There's no compulsion here. That's why it's all questions in hopes that they will have a desire to change on their own. And how's that going to happen? Go back to verse 10. Because in the context of that original set of questions about captivity to deliverance, he lets us know how it happened. In verse 10, I ask of you, on what conditions are they saved? Let me ask it again. Yea, what grounds had they to hope for salvation? Let me ask it again. What is the cause of their being loosed from the bands of death and the chains of hell? What's he asking in those three question marks? Conditions, grounds, and cause. How does change happen? He answers the question in verse 11. Behold, I can tell you. He doesn't make him wait long. Did not my father Alma believe in the words which were delivered by the mouth of Abinadi? Was he not a holy prophet? Did he not speak the words of God and my father Alma believed them? Remember, that's what he talked about in those earlier verses. In verse 5, what delivered Alma and his people from Noah, from Amulon, from the Lamanites? He did deliver them out of bondage by the power of his word. Verse 7, he says it again. Their souls were illuminated by the light of the everlasting word. It was God's word that delivered them. What does this chapter begin with in verse 1? 
Alma began to deliver the word of God unto the people. How does John 1 begin his gospel? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the word of God. And by delivering Jesus to the people, there is hope for them to be saved. He is the conditions. He is the grounds. He is the cause of salvation. Verse 13, my father preached the word unto your fathers, just like Abinadi preached the word unto him, and a mighty change was wrought in their hearts. Because of that word and the effect that it had, they humbled themselves. They weren't stripped of pride. They removed it. They put their trust in the true and living God. The arm of flesh didn't have to be taken from them. They removed their trust from it themselves. They were faithful unto the end. Therefore, they were saved. It's the word that does it. In verse 12, according to his faith. Faith in what? Faith in the words that were given him. Faith in the words of Abinadi. Faith in the words of Alma the elder. Faith in the words of all the holy prophets. Faith in the word of God. According to that faith, there was a mighty change wrought in his heart in their hearts, in our hearts. So whether it's round one, Abinadi to Alma, whether it's round two, Alma the elder to his people at the waters of Mormon or the land of Helam or into the land of Zarahemla, or whether it's round three, Alma the younger, delivering the word to the people of the church in Zarahemla. In any instance, if we exercise faith in that word, then a mighty change can occur in our hearts, especially when that faith facilitates its partner principle, repentance. Faith unto repentance, we'll later read in the Book of Mormon often. That's the other solution that Alma is recommending. Faith in God's word, his promises, leading to repentance of our sins. He says that in verse 32, on the heels of all this talk about preparing to meet God, preparing quickly. In fact, 31, those who are not prepared, the time is at hand that he must repent or he cannot be saved. So in 32, the invitation, repent, repent, for the Lord God hath spoken it. 33, he sendeth an invitation unto all men, for the arms of mercy are extended towards them. He saith, repent, and I will receive you. I love the way he prefaces that call to repentance at the beginning of the verse. He sendeth an invitation we sometimes say that when somebody just won't do something and we'll just say, what, what do you need, an engraven invitation? I don't know where that phrase first came from, but it is interesting to ponder an engraven invitation. And so that when his arms of mercy are extended towards us, he who has engraven us upon the palms of his hands, as Isaiah says, then he is sending an engraven invitation to come. I will receive you. What better evidence of that can I offer? Repent, I will receive you. In verse 49, that invitation is to all, to everyone that dwelleth in the land, yea, to all, both old and young, both bond and free, to the aged, to the middle-aged, to the rising generation, they must repent and be born again. It's never too early to do it, you of the rising generation. It's never too late to do it, you who are the aged, both old and young, both bond and free. I doubt it was physical captivity he was talking about here, but the kind of captivity he described at the beginning of this chapter, this call to repent is meant for all who are bound and all those who might think they are free. The command, the call, the invitation to repent is extended to all of us because all of us need it. Verse 50, he repeats it. Thus saith the Spirit, repent, all ye ends of the earth. The kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. Yea, the Son of God cometh in his glory, in his might, majesty, power, and dominion. Verse 51, the Spirit saith unto me, yea, crieth unto me with a mighty voice. This doesn't sound like the still, small whisper we usually associate with the Holy Ghost. He is crying. 
he is raising a mighty voice. And what is his message? Go forth and say unto this people, Repent. For except ye repent, ye can in no wise inherit the kingdom of heaven. And scattered throughout all these calls and cries and commands and invitations to repent is a sense of urgency, of 60 seconds till the interview. We see it in 27. If you were called to die at this time, we see it in 28, prepare quickly. And 29, prepare quickly. We see it in 31, the time is at hand. And again in 36, the time is at hand. In 50, where we just read, the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. The Son of God is coming. The glory of the King of all the earth, the King of heaven, shall very soon shine forth among all the children of men. There's no time to wait. In 52, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. How much time has to pass before the hewer can begin chopping? If it's harvest time, if this is Jacob 5 and the servant is being told to hew down the trees that are cumbering the ground of my vineyard. In my case, it takes forever to be able to start yard work. I can't find any of the tools that I need. Which of my children used one last and where did they leave it? But not in this case. The axe is right next to the root of the tree. Pick it up and swing. That's exactly what John the Baptist said to his audience. The axe is right there and we need to repent right now. As he says in verse 56, another powerful adverb, those who persist in their wickedness will be hewn down and cast into the fire. The axe is right there ready to chop except they speedily repent. Do it now. That is the invitation that the Lord extends to all. To see it repeated throughout the chapter, look at verse 34. Come unto me, and ye shall partake of the fruit of the tree of life. Yea, ye shall eat and drink of the bread and the waters of life freely. 35. Yea, come unto me, and bring forth works of righteousness. 37, to all you who have gone astray as sheep having no shepherd. A shepherd hath called after you. He is still calling after you. Will ye hearken unto his voice? 38, I say unto you that the good shepherd doth call you. Yea, in his own name he doth call you. That merciful name, that long-suffering name, that loving name, that name of Christ. 57, all ye that are desirous to follow the voice of the Good Shepherd, come ye out from the wicked. Be separate. Touch not their unclean things. Over and over in this chapter, he keeps saying to come, to come unto Christ. Verse 60, I say unto you that the Good Shepherd doth call after you. If you will hearken unto his voice, he will bring you into his fold. You are his sheep. You don't have to be the sheep of the adversary. You don't have to be part of the fold of the devil. You're not his children. He's done nothing to make you his. So stop choosing him. Choose Christ by responding to his voice. Verse 62, I love the way he ends this chapter. I speak by way of command unto you that belong to the church. I, yes, I took off my political hat, but I still wear my religious one. And in the authority of my holy office, that priesthood order after the Son of God, I command you to do these things. Meanwhile, to those who do not belong to the church, recognizing that his would be a mixed multitude, I speak by way of invitation. I love that. To the church, you know you should be doing this. You covenanted to. You were baptized unto repentance, so repent. You said that you would. I reiterate God's command that you act according to your covenant. And to all of those who have not made one yet, I invite you to do so. I invite you to come and be baptized unto repentance, that ye also may be partakers of the fruit of the tree of life. I love that Alma is simultaneously speaking by way of command and by way of invitation. 
I think we need to do a lot more of both, especially the latter. To those outside the church, every chance that we can, just to speak by way of invitation, to be inviting in the way we talk about the church, to be inviting in the way we talk about repentance or change, the influence that the gospel has had in our lives, to always leave an open door for anyone who might want to enter, to speak by way of invitation. This is the message of Alma chapter 5. One other way to summarize it briefly, after asking this multitude of questions about the past and present and future, he begins inviting in verses 33 to 35. He lays out clearly the two options that are before them in verses 36 through 42. He lets them know how he knows which is the right choice in 43 through 49. He then asks if they will change or stay the same with this choice presented to them. That's verse 51 through 56. And he ends again with this call from the good shepherd to come unto him. And through it all, he emphasizes the mercy and long suffering of the Holy Messiah, the coming of Christ, the King of heaven, who would very soon shine forth to bring them into his marvelous light. How were they to be delivered? Go back to the beginning. In verse 7, he changed their hearts. Exactly what Alma was after from the beginning. Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Also in 7, he awakened them out of a deep sleep. They awoke unto God. They were illuminated by the light of the everlasting word. Now, we saw this at the beginning, but come back to it here at the end. The end of seven describes being encircled about by the bands of death and the chains of hell. This is the captivity that they would need to be delivered from. But in nine, those bands were broken. Those chains were loosed. And notice the result. I love this at the end of verse nine. Yea, they were loosed and their souls did expand. What had those chains been doing before? Constricting them. And once the chains were broken, the soul itself could expand to full capacity. Have you ever felt that happen inside you? I usually have horrible posture. All those years of playing piano, it was like Hunchback of Notre Dame, just hunched over the keyboard. Sometimes we feel that way if we've been over our laptops too long, right? But what's interesting is if you've been hunched for a long period to the point that your back almost feels like it's stuck in that position. When you sit up straight and probably even feel some cracking in your back, or when you've been stooped over for so long and then stand fully erect, full stature, have you ever felt your spirit do that inside you? to shake off the chains that have been constricting you spiritually. The expansion of soul that he describes here is magnificent. There's actually a verse in Isaiah 28 where in his beautiful poetic imagery, he describes things as a bed that is too short to sleep on or a blanket that's too narrow to wrap yourself in. I love that mental image. I've got a brother that's like 6'9 or 6'10. I'm the, the runt of the litter, and I'm 6'1. But he has yet to find a bed that he can have both a headboard and a footboard. He's just too long for it. Or maybe you've tried to sleep on a couch that is just too short, and you cannot stretch to full capacity. Spiritually speaking, that's the chains of hell or the bands of death. Or that other analogy that Isaiah uses, the blanket that's too narrow to wrap yourself in it. You ever try to sleep with a blanket like that? It's like either your legs can be warm or your chest can be warm, but not both at the same time, unless you're in the fetal position. I remember getting out of the shower once and the only towel that was available was a hand towel. Just, just trying to dry off like that. In an Isaiah class I taught years ago, there was a convert student and I asked her about the, those analogies and asked her if they meant anything to her as a convert to the church. And it was beautiful to hear her description of being able to reach the full potential of her spirit when she found a bed 
long enough and a blanket big enough to wrap herself in, to stretch out on. That's the fullness of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Their souls did expand. And what did they do with that expanded soul? And they did sing redeeming love. It's like those old movies when you see some poor woman that has to wear a corset. And they just can't breathe. There's no room for their lungs to expand. They can't even talk. Well, to be encircled by these chains and bands, no wonder we can't sing until they're loosed from us. But when those chains come off, those chains forged by our own foolishness, when they come off, our souls expand and we are able to sing redeeming love. It makes me think of that beautiful folk hymn written by a Baptist minister called, How Can I Keep From Singing? If you're anything like me, you may know the tune without having paid much attention to the words. That's, I'm always guilty of that. My wife knows the lyrics of everything. I just pay attention to the melody. But the words of that hymn, can you picture Alma the Elder singing this once Abinadi's words loosed him from chains? Can you picture Alma's people, Helam and the rest, singing these words once Alma's testimony broke their chains? Can you picture Alma the Younger singing these words after the angel has helped break these bands? And can you picture the people of the church in Zarahemla throughout all the land singing, singing the song of redeeming love because of their faith in the words that Alma the Younger has given them and the repentance of their sins that would follow. My life goes on in endless song, above earth's lamentations. I hear the real, though far off hymn, that hails a new creation. That new creation is us, born of God, new image in our countenance, new heart changed by Christ. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear its music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? While though the tempest loudly roars, I hear the truth, it liveth. And though the darkness round me close, songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble in their fear and hear their death knell ringing, isn't that the devil trying to keep his sheep cringing in the fold? His subjects, his children, still encircled and encompassed by the bands and chains that he's made. When friends rejoice both far and near, how can I keep from singing? In prison cell and dungeon vile, our thoughts to them are winging. When friends by shame are undefiled, how can I keep from singing? These saints, no longer defiled by the shame of their sins, the stains on their garments, but garments washed white, purified, cleansed through the blood of Jesus. How could they keep from singing? There's no better use for the air that fills an expanded soul. And to any of us who have felt that in the past, who have felt the Spirit sit up, straighten up, stand up to full stature, who have felt an expanded soul and felt to sing the song of redeeming love, then verse 26 is our next, perhaps our final question. Now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if ye have experienced a change of heart, these were church members after all, if ye have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can ye feel so now? Do you still feel now what you felt then? 
or have the chains begun restricting you again? What's your spiritual lung capacity right now? Is pride beginning to weave its costly clothing once again? Is it something we can take off and lay aside so it doesn't have to be stripped from us? Can we care for the poor? Can we avoid any semblance of inequality or persecution of others? Can we retain in remembrance sufficiently our own captivity and deliverance sufficiently to know it can happen again? Can we keep singing right now? One of my best friends in high school, his father had a heart transplant at the UCLA Medical Center. I'd heard of such surgeries, but never knew anyone who'd actually undergone one until this good friend's father. And my friend told me that his dad would need to be on medication for the rest of his life to keep his body from rejecting what it perceived as foreign material. In fact, a more recent apostolic heart surgeon, not Elder Nelson this time, but rather Elder Renland, gave an amazing talk in which he used this analogy of heart transplants as an example of the mighty change of heart. But the need to take constant medication to avoid this kind of rejection of foreign tissue. Can we feel so now? Are we maintaining and retaining the mighty change brought about by the word and our repentance? So maintaining the word, faith in that word, repentance because of that faith, when I think of the song of redeeming love and the need to be able to continue singing it, I often think of that beautiful hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, particularly because it speaks of being prone to wander. I feel that too. The natural man, even when we put it off, never seems to go that far away. That beautiful hymn was written by a man who'd lived a wicked life. He was prone to wander until he heard the word powerfully preached by the Reverend George Whitfield, one of the greatest preachers of the 18th century. And the man turned everything around, repented, became a minister himself, and wrote this song. I was only familiar with the first three verses, the ones that are usually sung. There is a fourth verse that seems to promise a day when we will keep singing. The fourth verse of that song says, Oh, that day when freed from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face. Clothed then in blood-washed linen, how I'll sing thy sovereign grace. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Take my ransomed soul away. Send thine angels now to carry me to realm of endless day. Isn't that what Alma is singing about here? Freed from sinning, broken bands and loosed chains, seeing thy lovely face, even seeing it within our own, his image in our countenance, his sovereign grace, because we've chosen to be his children, trusting our ransomed souls to his keeping, being carried to a realm of endless day illuminated by the light of Christ's everlasting word. I am so grateful for the changes within each of us, that the gospel of Jesus Christ and the grace of Christ himself affect in us. It often takes asking and answering honestly within ourselves these kinds of questions. The simple fact that Alma asked that question in 26 if you've ever experienced the mighty change, do you still feel it? If you've sung before, are you singing now? Should serve as a warning to each of us of the ongoing need for continual conversion. Alma understood that, which is why in chapter six, once this life-changing sermon is over, he ordains priests and elders by the laying on of hands, according to the order of God to preside and watch over the church. In verse 2, they baptize unto repentance all those who repent of their sins and join the church. Notice the interesting order there, right? They repented of their sins and therefore were baptized unto repentance. You're into the process now. You're into that covenant relationship. 
Repentance leads to baptism, which leads to continual repentance. This is what the church is. Remember Alma the Elder learned that in chapter 26 of Mosiah? This is a perfect parallel to King Benjamin's address back at the beginning of Mosiah. Even the chapter numbers coincide. In Mosiah 5, these people's hearts have been changed. And so to help them maintain that change, in chapter 6, King Benjamin takes their names so that they can be watched over and stirred up unto continued repentance. Here, Alma 5, Alma the Younger has a similar life-changing message to that of King Benjamin. And in chapter 6, the church is there to help nurture that faith. Maybe that's why the scriptures so often talk about the choirs above, not solo singing. Perhaps we're better able to maintain those melodies when there are harmonies surrounding us. There is a clear division now between those church members who have begun again to sing the song of redeeming love, along with those new converts that have repented and then been baptized unto repentance, compared to former church members that decide either to ignore Alma's questions or to answer them in ways he had not hoped. Verse 3, those that do not repent of their wickedness, those that do not humble themselves before God, those that remain lifted up in the pride of their hearts, those were rejected and their names were blotted out, no longer numbered among those of the righteous. There needed to be a way of telling, not just, hey, we're all church members. In a place like Zarahemla, church headquarters, that's an easy thing to say. And cultural Christians and committed Christians all mingle together into one big mass. The church needed to stand out more clearly than that. And so there was a division. Names were blotted out. We saw that earlier in the book of Alma. Names of the unrepentant blotted, others withdrawing themselves. But to allow clearer lines of whose fold people were choosing to be a part of. That does not mean we give up hope on those who have chosen to withdraw themselves or even those who has, whose names have been blotted out. Because even with these dividing lines, the visitor's welcome sign is still prominent on the outside of the church. Verse 5, the word of God was liberal unto all. None were deprived of the privilege of assembling themselves together to hear the word of God. Because that's how it all begins, or how it begins again, always through the word of God. All were welcome in verse 5. In verse 6, some were commanded. This sounds a lot like how Alma ended his sermon, right? If you're part of the church, you're commanded to do these things. If you're not, you're invited to. Well, he's inviting in 5. The word is liberal to all. He's commanding in 6. The children of God, those who have covenanted, they were commanded to gather themselves together oft, to join in fasting and mighty prayer in behalf of the welfare of the souls of those who knew not God. Of course, Alma the Younger would have faith in that. Isn't that what the angel told him? Part of the reason he had come was because of the faith and fasting and mighty prayer of his own father. Well, having left a church, a group of children of God, in that condition, in the land of Zarahemla, Alma is ready to start going east and west and north and south to share similar messages wherever he can find saints in need of perfecting. The next one he meets is the church in the land of Gideon. And his message to them is magnificent. In some ways, the message to the people of Gideon, which is Alma chapter 7, is even better than the message he gives to the people in Zarahemla in chapter 5. Because the people in Gideon didn't need the wake-up call that chapter 5 was to the people of Zarahemla. In some ways, you can see chapter 7 almost as a sequel to chapter 5, or what could have been if people were already living chapter 5, a message to the awakened rather than a wake-up call to those that were spiritually asleep. You see that clearly in verse 3, where Alma says to them, I have come having great hopes and much desire that I should find that ye had humbled yourselves before God, that you had continued in the supplicating of his grace, that I should find that ye were blameless before him, not in the awful dilemma that our brethren were in at Zarahemla. 
Now Zarahemla is doing fine, he says in verse 4. Chapter 5 served its purpose. But in verse 5, I'm hoping for even more joy over you than I had over them. Theirs came after affliction and sorrow. It was worth it, but that was a harder message to preach. For you, in verse 6, I trust that you are not in a state of so much unbelief as were your brethren. I trust you're not lifted up in the pride of your hearts, so I don't have to warn you about it being stripped of you. I trust that you have not set your hearts upon riches and the vain things of the world, so I don't have to warn you against worldliness or wean you off materialism. Yea, I trust that you do not worship idols, but that you worship the true and the living God and that you look forward for the remission of your sins with an everlasting faith which is to come. I had to revive all of those feelings among the people of Zarahemla. I trust that they're already alive and well in you. Sure enough, those hopes were fulfilled. In verse 17, he tells them that. I know you believe these things because of the manifestation of the Spirit which is in me. Your faith is strong concerning these things. And as a result, great is my joy. You see in verse 18, drawing it back full circle to where he began, I had desire that you wouldn't be in the same dilemma as your brethren. And my desires have been gratified. You're exactly the kind of audience I was hoping for. Verse 19, I perceive that you are in the paths of righteousness. I don't have to bring you back to them. I perceive that you are in the path which leads to the kingdom of God. I can just stand back and cheer you on. Yea, I perceive that you are making his paths straight. I think that's Alma's favorite. It's not just that you're on the path, but that you're making those paths straight to make it easier for those behind you to follow. They're not just coming unto Christ. They're making it possible for Christ to come unto all. Well, if this is the kind of congregation that Alma dreamed of, If they didn't have to be stirred up unto repentance, but could be cheered on in their discipleship instead, then what message did he have for them? When I was young, I used to laugh that almost every talk that Elder Richard G. Scott gave in conference seemed like it was about repentance. He'd stare into the camera and tell us to repent. Maybe I just heard that because that's what I needed. But I sometimes laugh and think, I wonder what he would have talked about if we had repented. He gave some incredible messages about learning from the Lord, about how to acquire spiritual knowledge and to be truly divinely led. I would have loved to learn more from him about those kinds of things. I would have loved to have more Alma 7 moments with that great apostle instead of needing so many Alma 5 wake-up calls. What did the faithful get to hear from Alma the Younger? Look at verse 7. Behold, I say unto you, there be many things to come, but there is one thing which is of more importance than they all. For the time is not far distant that the Redeemer liveth and cometh among his people. To both congregations, he is teaching Christ. But to see the promises here, what will Christ do as he comes among the faithful? Not just what he will do to deliver the captives who were not. In verse 9, The Spirit says to him, Cry unto this people, saying, Repent ye, and prepare the way of the Lord. Even the righteous need to repent. Remember his engraven invitation is to both the bond and the free. The first thing that the Lord will say in 3 Nephi 10, after the wicked have been destroyed and his audience is solely the righteous, is repent. We all need that. Repent ye, prepare the way of the Lord, walk in his paths. As we saw in verse 19, that's exactly what they're doing. For behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the Son of God cometh upon the face of the earth. Now notice what he teaches. Some of the most profound teachings about the atonement of Christ we'll see anywhere in Scripture. And it's given to a faithful congregation of righteous saints. Verse 10, Behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. Now, I said this message was about the atonement. It is. It's an Easter message. But Easter messages typically start with Christmas messages. 
in our lesson from Abinadi. That's why he taught Christology in order to help us understand soteriology. Christology, the study of the nature of Jesus, Son of God and Son of Mary, to understand soteriology, the study of the atonement. There's no Easter without Christmas. There's no atonement without incarnation. There is no Messiah without Mary. And so just as King Benjamin mentions Mary in his discussion of the coming of Christ, Alma the Younger does the same. It was his divine and human dual inheritance that allowed Jesus to perform the atonement, which we'll see in verse 11 through 13. He shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. And this that the word might be fulfilled, which saith he will take upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people. And he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people. Those same bands that he talked about in chapter 5. He will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Now I spoke about these verses in the lesson that we made for Easter called the awful arithmetic of the atonement. This was part of the addition of that arithmetic. And I talked about my nemesis as a young kid living next to Magic Mountain, Six Flags in Southern California. That cartoon cutout that put his hand out at the beginning of the line that said, must be this tall to ride. I hated not being tall enough to get on. That was the minimum height requirement. And once I met the minimum as a child, I thought, I'm good. I can ride anything I want in this park. I can stop growing. Now, I'm glad I didn't max out at 54 inches or whatever it was. But the principle was true. Once you hit the minimum, there's no need to continue. Now, I have wondered if there was a minimum suffering requirement when it came to Jesus. According to Jacob in 2 Nephi chapter 9, the minimum would have been sin and death. Those were the two deaths that Adam and Eve brought upon the human race. Physical death and spiritual death. Death and hell, a two-headed monster, according to Jacob's description. To be the Messiah then, Jesus would have to suffer the sins of all humanity and suffer death for all, that he might overcome death. But I wonder, if that's the minimum, why did Jesus do so much more? Look at the verbs in verse 11 and 12 and 13. Over and over, it's take upon him. He did take upon him. It wasn't forced upon him by the Father. His was a voluntary offering, a submission of the will of the flesh to the will of the Spirit. But to ask for these additions, to take upon him more than the minimum, we saw the list suffering pains and afflictions and temptations, and multiply that by infinity, since it's of every kind. He took upon him pains and sicknesses. Yes, 12 says he took upon him death. And 13, it says he took upon him sin. So yes, he met the minimum. He did what was required of him. But so far beyond it, he took our infirmities. And why did he do it? Verse 12 says that his bowels may be filled with mercy so that he could know how to succor his people according to their infirmities, according to what we are going through. This is the gift of perfect empathy. What did we gain from Gethsemane? Atoning grace, forgiveness, redemption. But what did Jesus gain from Gethsemane? Understanding, empathy, a perfection of his perfect love. So he would know what we're going through. I wonder if the only thing he felt from us was our sin and the price that was required to redeem us from them. If the only thing he felt on our part was death, I could picture if it were me getting angry and yet to see Jesus ask, take upon him, I don't just want to feel what they did. I need to feel what they felt about what they did. I need to know the weakness that went into this the strength of their temptations and the weakness of their will. I want to know it all so that I'll love them 
instead of being angry, so that I'll understand them, so that I can help them, so that my preparations can be full. To some degree, yes, he would have known that. He was omniscient after all. That's what Alma seems to suggest at the beginning of verse 13. Now the Spirit knoweth all things. But that's just the Spirit knowing it. That's what Elder Maxwell called the cognitive. That's me understanding what my wife is going through in childbirth just because I've read what to expect when you're expecting. That knowledge is not knowledge at all. At least not on the level to truly empathize with someone. To have compassion, come meaning with, passion meaning suffering. To become a fellow sufferer with us so that Christ's bowels could be filled with mercy and not just justice that yes I met those demands mercy I want to meet those demands because I know what they're made of now I know how they feel that's why the phrase according to the flesh keeps coming up in verse 12 and 13 he wanted mercy according to the flesh he wanted to know according to the flesh So that in 13, the Spirit may have known already cognitively, but the Son of God suffereth according to the flesh, experientially now, that he might take upon him the sins of his people, that he might blot out their transgressions. Interesting that sins and transgressions was the last thing he listed, as if this request to feel pains and afflictions and temptations and sicknesses and infirmities was preparation for him to be able to react to and respond to our sins and transgressions with nothing but mercy, love, a desire to succor us. That is the power of his deliverance. And that is the testimony that's in Alma and hopefully the testimony that's in each of us. If it is, if we understand just how perfectly Jesus understands us, then how could we deny those engraven invitations? How could we not come unto this fold, not just of the good shepherd, but of the best shepherd that's ever lived, one who laid down his life for his sheep, one who joined them in their mortal pasture, to understand everything that we go through. If that is the testimony which is in us, then how can we keep from singing? Or in 14, how can we keep from repenting and being born again? Yes, even the faithful need that rebirth. Even the righteous people of Gideon need to be changed by Christ. If we're not born again, we cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So come. Be baptized unto repentance, that you may be washed from your sins, that you may have faith on the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, who is mighty to save and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. Like I said earlier, both the people of Zarahemla and the people of Gideon are getting messages about Jesus Christ. But the focus for the people in Zarahemla is Christ as shepherd, And to the people in Gideon, it is Christ as Lamb of God. There was a little more lion in chapter 5 and a lot more lamb in chapter 7. A lot more calling us to come into his fold in chapter 5. And a lot more laying down his life for the world in chapter 7. Verse 15, yea, come and fear not. What would we possibly have to fear? from a Messiah who has perfect empathy for each of us. It's why the book of Hebrews says to come boldly to the throne of grace, fearlessly to come boldly. Why? Because we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was tempted in all things like as we yet without sin. He knows our needs to our weakness. He's no stranger. He gets it because he gets us. So come boldly. There's nothing to fear from someone who knows our situation even better than we do. Lay aside every sin. 
which easily doth beset you, which binds you down to destruction. Yea, come and go forth, show unto your God that you are willing to repent of your sins and enter into a covenant with him to keep his commandments and witness it unto him this day by going into the waters of baptism. Doesn't that sound like Alma the Elder at the waters of Mormon? Well, like father, like son with these two magnificent missionaries. If you do this, verse 16, and keep the commandments from thenceforth, again, this is a commitment from this moment on, the same will remember that I say unto him, yea, he will remember that I have said unto him, he shall have eternal life, according to the testimony of the Holy Spirit, which testifieth in me. Well, this invitation continues at the end of the chapter. After having congratulated them, as I shared earlier, that they had met and exceeded Alma's high expectations, He says in verse 22, Now, my beloved brethren, I have said these things unto you that I might awaken you to a sense of your duty to God, that you may walk blameless before him, that you may walk after the holy order of God after which ye have been received. This isn't them receiving priesthood. This is priesthood receiving them. Verse 23, I would that ye should be humble, not stripped of pride. Be submissive not compelled to change. Be gentle, not hard of heart. Be easy to be entreated, full of patience and long-suffering. Being temperate in all things, important to include that among all the others, since sometimes our lack of temperance makes it very difficult for us to put up with people that still need a chapter 5 talking to. Being diligent in keeping the commandments of God at all times, Another thing that needs to be coupled with that same temperance, that we might have patience for people who are not yet keeping those commandments. Asking for whatever things you stand in need, both spiritual and temporal, always returning thanks unto God for whatsoever things you do receive. I love that last phrase. Our gratitude is just a returning of something that belongs to God to begin with. It's the one leper out of ten who returns to give thanks. Verse 24, see that ye have faith, hope, and charity, and then ye will always abound in good works. Best of all, those good works will be performed for the right reasons. He then says in 25, kind of this final parting blessing, may the Lord bless you and keep your garments spotless cleansed, purified, washed, well, now kept, kept spotless, so that once again, you can feel like you're in good company with fellow servants who have been washed before you, to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the holy prophets who've been ever since the world began, having your garments spotless, even as their garments are spotless, in the kingdom of heaven to go no more out. My beloved brethren, oh, I wish that we could hear this from a prophet as he concludes general conference. I have spoken these words unto you according to the spirit which testifieth in me, and my soul doth exceedingly rejoice because of the exceeding diligence and heed which ye have given unto my word. If we will respond more speedily to the Alma Fives, we will be prepared to receive the kinds of messages of an Alma 7, which then concludes, and may the peace of God rest upon you, upon your houses and lands, your flocks and herds, your women, your children, according to your faith and good works, both of which result from a changed heart and a spiritual rebirth. May they continue from this time forth and forever. Thus I have spoken. Amen. My dear friends, wherever you happen to be along this spectrum, Alma 5 to Alma 7, anything in between, the process of coming into Christ, the process of this spiritual rebirth is the same. It is opening ourselves to the redeeming word of God, exercising faith in that word, repenting of our sins, and covenanting to continue to do so. So have you, have I, been spiritually born of God? 
Have we received his image in our countenances? Have we experienced this mighty change of heart? Have our souls expanded? Have we felt to sing the song of redeeming love? And do we still feel so now? The fact that you're even watching and wanting to let the word of God have its effect in your life is a good sign that you are in the paths that Alma described to the people of Gideon. May we continue to make those paths straight for other people who are just as deserving of this mighty change of heart and just as anxious to allow it to happen.